John Penrose. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I begin by welcoming this motion today, and particularly by welcoming uh, the response by my right honourable friend, the Minister, um, when he said that he, I, I, I think I'm not misquoting him, saying he basically supports the principle behind this motion, even though I think um, uh, we, we are intending to abstain on it um, on this side of the House. Um, but nonetheless, the principle behind this motion is important because standards in public life matter and the Nolan principles matter. And if any of us, on any side of this House, start to think that they are technical, that they are passing fancies, that they are things which come and go, then we are all of us fundamentally misunderstanding our role here. They are misunderstanding the importance of the integrity which the Nolan principles enshrine. Um, and we are also, I think, um, putting in danger the way that our democracy is being perceived amongst constituents, the people who voted to send us here in the first place. Um, and the crucial thing is that in many cases, many of us will face the, have faced the situation where people say, oh, those MPs up in Westminster, they're all the same apart from my local MP. And that's great if you're the local MP they're referring to, because you know that they know you and that they hold you in higher regard. But just think about what it says for democracy in general. Um, if they say that as a class, MPs are held in such low regard and democracy is so mistrusted and distrusted. It cannot be good for this place as an institution, it cannot be good for our democracy, and therefore it is essential that none of us underplay or forget the central and enduring importance of the Nolan principles and of standards in public life. So I was delighted to hear um, that I think there's, broadly speaking, cross-party agreement on the principles of these. That's absolutely great. It bears repetition. It bears constant repetition, and I'm glad to see it. So I wanted to support much of this motion myself, particularly an awful lot of the recommendations, the 34 recommendations um, in the Committee on Standards in Public Life, but not quite all. There are many, many things which are extremely admirable and which I have called for myself and which I propose quickly to just summarise here today. There are one or two things where I would disagree with what the Committee on Standards and Public Life has said, in spite of the fact that overall its, a, it's, a, its report is excellent. But I also want to add one or two things which I think have become clear over the last few days, which need to be done to further strengthen the role of the independent advisor on the ministerial code. And I'll come to those in a minute. But if I can, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are many things which are already, have already been done, and I won't repeat what my Honourable Friend the Minister um, outlined, but there are many parts of this report that have already been introduced. I won't go through them again, but they are welcome, they are necessary, and I have supported them uh, as they were introduced, and I still support them today. But there is a great deal of the recommendations, a great number of the recommendations in the CSPL report which have not yet been introduced, and I devoutly hope that they will be. For example, and, uh, and in no particular order of importance, there, are, there is a parallel report, incidentally, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Boardman report, um, number three, he's done several, um, which was um, issued um, middle of last year and which, for which a government response remains outstanding. And I hope that I can press the Minister in his, uh, in his summing up remarks at the end of this, um, uh, at the end of this debate to, uh, to reveal or to explain to us, uh, any member of the front bench to explain to us, um, when and whether the response to the Borman report is going to be put out, because logically the government should respond to that report at the same time as it responds to the Committee on Standards in Public Life. The two go together, they have mutually complementary um, sets of recommendations, and it should happen at the same time. And in particular, for example, both the Borman report and, I think, the Committee on Standards in Public Life recommends that uh, uh, proposals for the Advisory Committee on, bus on Business Interests, i.e. what we can all do as Members of Parliament, after we have left this place in order to take jobs outside, um, whether or not those, uh, those recommendations should be binding on us. There's a really, really simple, really, really clear, really, really sensible recommendation in the Borman report, in the, and I think it's also um, uh, duplicated here in this Committee on Standards and Public Life, that we should be required, if we are ministers, to sign a deed, a legal deed that says, I will abide by the decisions of ACABA, and therefore they become legally binding on the minister concerned, even when they ceased to be a minister. So there are a series of very sensible proposals in this report by the CSPL and in the Bourbon report which need to be implemented, they need to be introduced, and they need to be introduced quickly because, as we've heard already today, the noise of 
Public drumming of fingers, tapping of feet, waiting to say, this is not good enough, we need to raise our standards, we need to raise our game. As a democracy, that noise is getting ever louder and we cannot afford to wait much longer. So those, those items need to be introduced. Ditto, incidentally, the recommendations on the lobbying rules. There's a whole series of recommendations in the Committee on Standards in Public Life's um, re recommendations which adhere to lobbying and they are recommendations 26 through to 30 for anybody who is interested and they complement the recommendations and which are being I think either discussed or have just been recommended and I, I forget their, their precise status of that being introduced by the Committee on Parliamentary Standards of which the Chair is about to put me right. They, we, 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 we've already made a recommendation, we've produced our report and I hope that the Government will allow time before the summer recess to be able to adopt a new code of conduct for the House. I thank the Chair for, for that clarification, and he's absolutely right, and if we put those recommendations alongside the recommendations in the Committee on Standards and Public Life's um, proposals on lobbying, together they make a suite of proposals which will make our democracy much more robust, much cleaner, much more transparent, and in general much better. So we should do those immediately, and I would encourage the Minister to put his foot as hard down on the accelerator as he possibly can to get those out and agreed and announced as quickly as we possibly can. So, there is much to agree with, Mr Deputy Speaker, in this report. I would, however, also venture to agree with the Minister when he says that there is a major concern, one major concern, that it is important about the notion of putting some of these recommendations on a statutory footing rather than adhering to the traditional constitutional principle that it has to be the Prime Minister who appoints his or her Cabinet and can dismiss his or her Cabinet. That is absolutely fundamental for any Prime Minister, it doesn't matter if they are a Labour Prime Minister, a Coalition Prime Minister, a Conservative Prime Minister, it is absolutely fundamental. And on that one point, it's an important point, but on that one point I would respectfully depart from the Committee on Standards in Public Life's recommendations. Mr Deputy Speaker, I won't trouble the House for very much longer, but I did say at the start of my remarks that I wanted to add a couple of points about the role of the, advisor on minister, the independent advisor on, ministerial, uh, on the ministerial code, um, which I believe have been revealed in the last couple of days. We have already heard from the Chair of the Parliamentary Standards Committee um, in an intervention earlier um, that at the moment the independent advisor feels it is impossible for him to make a recommendation which, if it was not taken, if his advice was not followed, he would then feel he had to resign. And that has led him, in this particular case, because it's never happened before, when the question is of whether or not the Prime Minister's conduct has followed the Ministerial Code or not, that has, meant, that has led him to not issue any recommendations or findings of fact, as he would with any other Minister at all. Mr Deputy Speaker, that isn't good enough. That cannot be allowed to continue. That is not strong enough as a way in which the, the independent advisor should work. And so I would propose two further changes, which I hope the Minister will, will, will listen to and, and, and follow. And one is that we should be very, very clear that it should not be a re resigning matter for the independent advisor if his or her advice is not followed by the Prime Minister of the day. They should be issuing independent advice, but in the same way as when Sir Chris Whitty issued advice to the Prime Minister during the pandemic on the medical and scientific um, uh, options available to him during the Covid crisis. Sometimes the Prime Minister took that advice, sometimes the Prime Minister didn't take that advice, um, but it did not lead Sir Chris Whitty to resign every time that didn't happen. It would have been plainly bonkers if he had done so. And, it's, and the same principle, I believe, should apply to the independent adviser. They should offer advice, it's then up to the Prime Minister to accept it or not accept it, and to justify his or her decision to Parliament as a result. And the corollary of that, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that in this case, it's too late now, but in this case, the independent advisor should have been able and should have been expected, had we introduced that change, to have issued a report into whether or not the Prime Minister had followed the ministerial code. He had the Sue Gray report in front of him. He could have said, and therefore this means the Prime Minister did follow the ministerial code here, didn't follow the ministerial code there. This one's a serious breach. That's a minor breach. That's not a breach at all. And at that point, Mr Deputy Speaker, we as a House would have had something to get our teeth into. We would have had something which would have clarified the situation 
and stripped out an awful lot of inevitable party political posturing and said we've all got a common shared base of facts. And without that, it has made the subsequent debate a great deal less targeted, a great deal less clear and a great deal less effective. To the Honourable Gentleman. Chris Bryant. I'm very grateful and I completely agree with everything that he's just said about the, minister, uh, the independent, supposedly independent adviser on ministerial um, code. I just wonder whether his interpretation of what Lord Guyot wrote wrote is the same as mine. My reading of it was that he basically felt that the Prime Minister had breached the Ministerial Code, but he didn't feel he could say so. I, I, I didn't reach that conclusion, which is why I waited until I, got, until I saw the um, Prime Minister's reply, which he published last week, justifying his, his view of his approach to the Ministerial Code, and which I intervened on the Minister for earlier on. And that's what then led me, I'm afraid, very sadly and with great regret, to resign my post yesterday. Um, but nonetheless, I'm pleased to know that he agrees with my broader point about the way that the um, independent advisers' powers should be further amended. And I'm afraid that's only just become apparent in the course of the last week or so that that is another further important omission. But without those changes, Mr. S Deputy Speaker, in one second, if I can, without those changes, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the entire process remains toothless. If, it for, if in future we have a question over whether or not the Prime Minister, him or herself, has adhered to the Ministerial Code. And I'll give way to the right honourable lady if she still wishes to come in. Back to it. Yeah, I apologise to the honourable member and I'm grateful to him for giving way. But I, I've been thinking about what he said earlier on when he said he, he differed from the views of the committee. And maybe I didn't follow exactly the terms of his observations. So I'm grateful if you'd correct me. But I got the impression that he was saying that he couldn't go all the way with the committee because he thought that we were giving the power to the independent advisor to decide whether a minister came or went. That is not the case. The independent advisor in the committee's recommendations was to advise on whether there had been a breach, but it's for the prime minister to make the decision. Yeah, yeah. I, I can reassure um, the right honourable lady that, that uh, I meant what she just said. My point about departing from the, uh, from the recommendations of the Committee on Standards and Public Life is about whether or not to make and some of these bodies statutory and to allow court oversight, which, are, uh, which is a constitutional point rather than the one she's making. But I was entirely content with the committee's point that she's just clarified with me. And so, Mr Deputy Speaker, the final point which I would make about the role of the independent advisor um, on ministerial interests, uh, on ministerial code, um, is that if we make the two changes I have just described, we then make sure that the process has teeth, but with one further change that will still be required. And that is that if the Prime Minister is found by their independent advisor to have met, breached, made a material breach of the ministerial code, it will then be necessary for this Parliament to sit in judgment on that report, because no one else can do it. And the Prime Minister certainly can't, because he or she will be judge and jury in, a, in their own case, and that, that's fundamentally never going to work. We will have to do that in a democratic way. We are ultimately the High Court of Parliament. That's what we are here to do. And at the moment, Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't think that our standing orders allow us to address that point, not about the government, which I still remain very strongly in favour of and in support of, but of the Prime Minister as an individual and you know, the, the provision to effectively either censure or, 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 or bring other motions is, I think, I believe, insufficiently um, clear and easy in that one specific and important case. And without it, again, this process will not have the necessary teeth and claws, which we hope will never have to be used, but they have to be there just in case they are needed. And with that, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will leave the debate to go. Thank you very much.